Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President here at the Atlantic Council, and I am delighted to welcome you to the Atlantic Council Global Strategy Initiative's virtual conversation about great power competition and a timely new book from our own Matt Cronard, The Return of Great Power Rivalry, Democracy from the Ancient World to the United States and China. We are so pleased to be joined by a group of accomplished foreign policy thinkers, Morgan Ortega, spokesperson for the U.S. Department of State, Thank you so much for taking time out of your extraordinarily busy schedule to be with us. We're joined by Bridge Colby, principal and co-founder of the Marathon Initiative, joining us from Brazil. And PBS NewsHour foreign affairs correspondent, Nick Schifrin, who will lead us uh, expertly through this, this conversation this morning. And of course, they're joining Matt Kronick, who is also the deputy director of the Spokoff Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. We look forward to hearing their thoughts on the U.S.-China relationship and the themes from Dr. Kronig's new book. So this discussion is especially relevant, I think, as the world finds itself in the midst of a cataclysm in the form of coronavirus. The post-war uh, the post-war um, order established after World War II and the primacy America has enjoyed for a quarter century are both being challenged. Already, China has begun to exert its influence abroad in this crisis, sending resources to nations struggling with the virus, touting its measures to stop the spread of the virus within its borders, and spreading disinformation about the virus's origins. The United States, meanwhile, is mobilizing at home, even as we have to acknowledge that we have been slow to adjust to the enormity of the crisis. And preoccupied at home, we don't see the United States and other leading democracies organizing a global response to the pandemic. All of this is happening as the global order is in a precarious position and great power rivalry is heating up. But despite these challenges, Dr. Cronin's new book suggests that America and its democratic allies have advantages that could help them emerge stronger from this crisis, that democracies can compete. Dr. Cronin's book considers centuries of history on the rivalry between autocracy and democracy to distill some lessons applicable to the defining ge geopolitical challenge of our time, the rise of China and the return of great power competition. Both this book and the event here today tackle two key priorities of the Atlanta Council, bolstering democracies in the face of assertive, assertive autocracies and navigating major power competition. I wanna uh, encourage as we get started that participants can purchase assigned or unsigned copies of the book by going to the Politics and Prose Bookstore website, you can qualify for free shipping by noting during checkout that you were referred to Politics and Prose by the Atlanta Council event. Finally, I wanna remind everybody today that this event is of course on the record and you can engage in the conversation using the hashtag Great Power Rivalry across social media platforms. Uh, and thank you for joining us on Zoom as well as the other platforms where this is being live streamed. Uh, we want to hear from you during the Q&A part of that. But thanks again for joining the Atlanta Council family. As I have to say, we celebrate Matt and Professor Cronin's work. Uh, congratulations, Matt, and uh, look forward to this conversation. With that, let me hand it over to our moderator. Thank you so much for Nick being with us. Over to you, Nick. David, thanks so much, and, and thanks to all of you. Obviously, we're all dealing with uh, unprecedented times and this calls for Zoom meetings uh, to talk about big ideas. And what's extraordinary for me is to see, I can see the list of participants and we have over 200 people watching. And so it's just amazing. And, and you're seeing my living room and I'm sure many of you uh, are in your living rooms as well. So welcome again to Dr. Kronig, uh, whose book we're gonna talk about, uh, Bridge Colby, who uh, I should mention up top, helped draft the national defense strategy that we're gonna be talking about. Tagus, uh, the state of spokesperson. Uh, and so Matt, if I could start with you uh, and, and give you a bit of a softball here, uh, but uh, we've heard a little bit uh, from Damon about the main points of your book, but there's a, there's a sense among some watchers that we are in the century of China, we're in the century of Asia, and, and that the U.S., uh, the U.S.'s power, the U.S.'s peak is, is, is in the rearview mirror. Uh, do you believe that? And, and how does your book uh, dispute that idea? Well, uh, thanks very much, Nick, and thanks to everyone for um, uh, turning out for this event and to the panelists for joining me. Uh, so it's exactly that conventional wisdom that inspired me to do this research and write this book. And it really started about 12 years ago after the global financial crisis, uh, when many people were saying, um, you know, we thought the U.S. model of open 
uh, markets and politics was working well, uh, but it didn't seem to do well in this global financial crisis and China might have weathered the storm better. And maybe this Chinese state-led capitalist uh, model uh, is better than uh, the U.S. model. Uh, and um, you know, this is something we've heard over the past uh, 10 years or so, that China has these bold, far-sighted leaders that can set a strategic direction, pull a lever, and, and get things done. Uh, meanwhile, we democracies dither in, in endless debate. Uh, and we're hearing that now over the response to the coronavirus. Um, but um, I, I was skeptical of this and so did some research, and the result is, is this book. And I come to the opposite uh, conclusion, uh, that uh, autocracies have some weaknesses, democracies or uh, uh, autocracy certainly have strength, but on balance, uh, democracies uh, have more economic, diplomatic, military strengths uh, that are relevant for great power competition. Uh, so I come out in a more optimistic place. And, um, uh, you know, the book has three major parts. The first is kind of political theory. What are the strengths and uh, weaknesses of uh, democracies and autocracies in general? Uh, second part is a historical study looking at seven autocratic versus democratic great power rivalries starting with the Greeks and the Persians 2,500 years ago, and then coming all the way forward to the U.S., Russia, and China today. And then the final part does analyze uh, U.S., Russia, and China uh, today. And um, so in, in short, uh, you know, I argue that um, the United States has some problems, but our fundamentals are still better than Russia's and China's, and that the United States is well positioned to be uh, the world's leading state uh, still for uh, many years to come. So um, uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there. So part of my role, of, of course, today and, and in general, I find, is, is to play devil's advocate. And throughout the next uh, 20 minutes or so, as, as we go through the panelists, you'll, you'll see me and hear me uh, play devil's advocate and, and offer ideas so the panelists can uh, refute them, probably. Uh, and so uh, that leads, it seems to me, if, if Dr. Krennic has given us the frame for where a great power competition is uh, and mentioned and coronavirus, of course, that leads to today uh, and, and to Morgan Ortegas and, and to the Trump administration. Uh, there is a narrative, as, as Matt suggests, that autocracies can handle something like the coronavirus better. Uh, and we see China uh, out front with uh, an information campaign, at the very least, you could call it something else, uh, suggesting that they have succeeded against the coronavirus uh, and are now spreading goodwill, spreading all of the equipment that they have, for example. Um, do you believe that authoritarian regimes like China uh, have succeeded at the coronavirus and are better uh, at dealing with something like the coronavirus? Uh, and what's the Trump administration doing to, to fight that narrative? Well, no, definitely don't believe that, but uh, thanks for the question. And, and it's interesting, the narratives that you just brought up, Nick, are, um, as you said, a, a part of a very purposeful campaign by the Chinese Communist Party, but also continually uh, we see the same narratives by the Russians and, and Iranians. Um, and what's really interesting, and uh, Leah Gabriel, who's the head of our GEC here at the State Department that tracks this sort of thing online, uh, we started noticing several weeks ago, months ago, a real convergence um, on the disinformation front from the three actors, from China, from Russia, from Iran. And you would often see things like Russian uh, propaganda, which we are all well aware of what they are capable of. Uh, you would see them uh, put out a narrative, and then you'd see uh, somewhat seemingly legitimate news organizations, which are normally state propaganda organizations in China or Iran, pick that up. And then, and then Russia would come back and retweet it. So it's this really interesting convergence of the three of them that we've seen. Obviously, the difference that we saw in the past uh, few weeks uh, and months is, is that Chinese Communist Party officials, uh, my counterparts, uh, started directly engaging um, in these uh, internet conspiracies. Jonathan Swan from Axios had a, a very powerful interview, I think it was last Sunday or the Sunday before, with the ambassador here in China, in which he confronted uh, confronted the Chinese ambassador on this, on this theory that many of you have heard about that the U.S. Army uh, was responsible for the spread of COVID. Um, and, and of course, the Chinese ambassador here famously uh, refuted that. So something very different. I haven't been in government since uh, the Obama administration. I was in the first term of, of Obama and coming back in, uh, one of the differences, one of the things I didn't expect is that I'd end up getting in, in somewhat of a, a Twitter war uh, with my county's China part. So it's it's a new way of doing, of doing foreign diplomacy and public diplomacy, I, I guess. Um, what we have seen is, you know, the president said last week uh, that he had a phone call with President Xi. Uh, 
um, and our GEC is tracking, and and we're seeing that the uh, that the Communist Party officials are are no longer going on that aggressive um, campaign uh, online, which they were for the past few weeks. We'll see how long it lasts. Um, that was certainly our goal to get that sort of stuff turned off. You know, the, the Chinese Communist Party has a special responsibility during this entire uh, crisis um, to be transparent. And that's difficult, of course, whenever the, your entire model of governance, and Matt can speak to this better than anyone, but when your entire model of governance is based uh, off of an authoritarian regime, is based off of censorship, it makes being transparent during uh, a crisis uh, like this very challenging. So what do we know? We know that this is not the first pandemic pandemic that the world has had to face together. We've, and recently, in the, in the past two decades, we've had uh, SARS, we've had Ebola, now we have COVID-19, which is, of course, spread more than, more than, uh, more than the other two. Um, so we know this isn't the first pandemic. We know it's not the last pandemic. And that's why, for, for us, it's not as much about the blame game um, as it relates to the CCP, but rather, what did, we, what did we get right? What did we get wrong? What did the Chinese Communist Party tell the world? What did they not tell the world? Because we're going to face another other pandemic. So that's why we have to get to the bottom line uh, of these answers. So uh, we're uh, incredibly focused. We know um, we, we're all very familiar with what the with what the Russians put out there. Um, this is, of course, um, troubling at times like this, the types of campaigns they go on, because this sort of misinformation and disinfo that they put out there means that vulnerable people uh, may not be getting the proper um, uh, notifications from their local health authorities or from the WHO. There's a lot of confusion. And then, of course, recently in the past few weeks, we've seen a very, very sustained campaign from the regime in Iran uh, to get sanctions relief. Um, obviously, the Trump administration withdrawing from the JCPOA would be a hot topic of conversation that we could debate amongst this panel for the next hour. Uh, but you know, we have seen that sustained campaign to deflect away from their own government's mismanagement um, as it relates to COVID-19. So I could keep going on this. Um, I'll stop. I sure you, I'm sure you want to get to other panelists, but we can certainly dive into CCP and Russia more writ large. So, so let's turn to Bridge Colby now. Um, uh, Bridge, as Morgan suggested, there is a lot there, but, but just to uh, tease out one aspect, right? So we saw uh, a bit of a cover-up um, from the Chinese government in the days and weeks after COVID-19 uh, uh, began in, in Wuhan, China. We saw doctors uh, being uh, essentially detained, uh, who are, are, were later called heroes. We saw so-called citizen journalists trying to convey some of the information that was really happening in Wuhan. And then fast forward a few months, uh, and you get this campaign by the Chinese government to try, uh, like, like Morgan was saying, and like I suggested before, try and suggest that they were victorious against this virus and are now uh, able to spread things like medical gear all across the world. Even critics of the government ask this question right now that, that, that I'll pose to you. Shouldn't we be working with China even at this moment where China did do all of the, those things, but this is a moment of global economic and medical crisis, and shouldn't we be working with China right now? So I, I put that to you. Great. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Nick, and thanks to Matt and uh, Atlantic Council, Damon, for having me, and great to be on with, with Morgan. Um, I think the answer is uh, a very, very qualified yes, which is to say we should only be cooperating within the framework of competition. And I think Matt uh, gets that exactly right in his uh, book, which I commend everybody's attention. Um, I think the reality is that you know there's a lot of people saying we need to go back. This is an, uh, uh, you know, an example of why we need to cooperate. I think it's actually the reverse. It's the most vivid possible demonstration of the downsides of uh, such deep vulnerability to the Chinese system, not just in sort of medical supplies, but in the, the leverage it affords and the vulnerability it, it creates. And I think, I think you, know, you hear a lot from the Hill, from both sides, I think, from the administration, saying, look, we're gonna have to be in a different place. And I think that's right. Now, within that broader competitive uh, context, recognizing the Chinese state for what it is and Chinese interests for what they are, Within that context, collaboration is possible, just as we could cooperate with the Soviet Union during some of the toughest periods of the Cold War on nonproliferation, for instance, or arms control. So I think that's possible. But I, I you know, I mean, I, you sort of see the, the zombie arguments of the 1990s and 2000s coming back saying, oh, you know, this shows the importance of unfettered globalization and, uh, you know, the hopes we can place in China. And I think that, I think honestly, they've just been 
discredit in the sort of more, most visceral uh, way possible. I mean, even if you think that the Chinese state is not malign, which I think, you know, there's pretty good evidence that actually they are, have pretty uh, antithetical interests and approaches to ours. But even if you don't, we can't be in a situation where we're still vulnerable. I mean, there've been reports, I think, of the Chinese canceling ventilator orders and stuff because they want to serve their own populace. I mean, at some level, you you can't fault them for that. Uh, but on the other hand, we also need to take uh, appropriate uh, precautions to protect ourselves in the future. So, Dr. Kroenig, if I could come back to you, uh, the idea of downsides uh, of vulnerability or the, or the downsides of having a, a globally integrated uh, supply chain, certainly, uh, and, and that collaboration is possible, but only within this, this larger context. Uh, and, and one of the points that you've been writing about uh, and that you've been suggesting is that mass diplomacy doesn't always work. Uh, and there are uh, endemic weaknesses, even in what China has been trying to do over the last few weeks after declaring victory. So why doesn't mass diplomacy always work? Well, uh, one of the advantages, democratic advantages I talk about in the book is uh, democracy's advantage uh, when it comes to diplomacy, uh, the better uh, alliance builders. Uh, and part of that is because they're bad at lying. Uh, the fact that democracies are bad at lying is actually one of their greatest strengths. That means other countries tend to trust them. It's part of the reason the United States has been able to build alliances like NATO uh, over the past um, uh, several decades. Um, on the other hand, um, autocracies are um, tend to be poor uh, alliance builders. Uh, they are good at lying, uh, and so that gives them certain advantages over disinformation and, and things like that. Uh, but it also means that people don't trust them uh, when it matters. Uh, and we've seen uh, throughout the uh, centuries, and even in the case of uh, China, that autocracies are more likely to fight with their own uh, allies than they are with uh, the enemies. You know, if you look at the Warsaw Pact, its major military actions uh, were against its own members, Russia invading uh, Hungary and the Czech Republic. Uh, Russia and China had a uh, alliance during the Cold War, and they nearly fought a nuclear war with each other. Uh, and so I think these are some of the uh, disadvantages of being uh, too close uh, with um, autocratic states. Uh, you know, when the United States tells a country, uh, we, we have your back, uh, or that, you know, our alliances are ironclad, uh, they can generally rest assured that we have their back. Um, if an autocracy says the same thing, you better better watch your back. Uh, and so um, I, I think um, um, Part of the problem with um, autocracies and their inability to make these more credible commitments internationally. Morgan Ortegas, can I ask the same question to you? Is it time to collaborate with China given the uh, global economic uh, and medical crisis that we face? Well, we already are, right? I, I think the, the question doesn't show the fact that we have been working with them. You know, we famously in the beginning of February uh, sent 17 tons of, of aid, uh, almost 18 tons of aid to China, medical supplies and equipment. These were donated by uh, Samaritan's Purse and other faith-based uh, organizations and NGOs in the United States. The State Department facilitated that. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you, you know, there's always going to be, whenever there's disinformation by Chinese Communist Party officials out there, the State Department and, and other members of the national security uh, apparatus of the administration are always going to have to, to counter that. But the best way to counter disinformation, in, in my opinion, um, is the good news story that, that actually exists. And, and we often forget that the American people remain uh, the, the single most generous block of people around the world. You know, I had my, my team look up just numbers, for example, for uh, U.S. contributions for WHO and UNICEF. 2019, the United States was at 400 million. Uh, China, 44 million. UNICEF, United States, and these are, of course, WHO, UNICEF, two organizations that are on the front line of responding to COVID around the world. 2019, United States contributed 700 million to UNICEF compared to China's 16 million. Um, and of course, you know, we have just committed, we announced last week, uh, we're at 274 million globally that the State Department's committed to fighting this pandemic around the world. Um, we may not be as good sometimes at, at telling uh, this story um, because of course we're very focused right now in the United States as we should be on fighting this pandemic here. But the the when you look at the international organizations, when you look at um, not just the American government, uh, but American companies, American 
American faith-based organizations, American, you know, NGOs. Uh, when the United States gives aid, when the United States works, works to tackle a pandemic uh, or, or something like this that we're facing around the world, it does so out of the spirit of generosity. It does so out of goodwill. It, and there's no nefarious sort of um, intentions behind that aid, behind that goodwill. So that's something that we're going to continue now to, to focus on um, as we see uh, other uh, great power competitors trying to, to tout their aid, their contributions to the world. We're very confident in uh, the, uh, the American people um, and their generosity. And, and when you look at that, you know, it's easy to say, say, oh, look, look at all the aid that China's sending to Italy. Oh, well, actually, the Italians had already purchased all of that. That wasn't aid, right? When you start going through all the international organizations, comparing, comparing apples to apples, comparing hard dollars, the United States, uh, the American taxpayer dwarfs anyone else um, in terms of contributions. That's something that we should be proud of, and that's something that I think that we need to, we need to be better about telling our story on. So, so Bridge Colby, this this is where it seemed we should expand the conversation out a little bit. Uh, there are narratives, for example, in Southeast Asia uh, about the United States that whereas the reality, the numbers, as Morgan suggests, are that the U.S., for example, uh, has a lot of investment in, in Southeast Asia, has technological alternatives to Chinese technology. Some of the narratives in, in Southeast Asia, especially uh, when, when we went around about half a dozen countries reporting on them, that, well, look, we like U.S. help, we like U.S. technology, but the Chinese package is better. The Chinese technology is, is, is more ready right now. Uh, and frankly, China's the big neighbor uh, and, and the United States is, is focused on itself. Uh, and so give us a, a, some, some context. Whereas the narratives in COVID-19, we also see that with Belt and Road Initiative, Chinese 5G and, and Huawei. How difficult is it for the U.S. to compete uh, all over the world right now with China being so aggressive, not only in information, but things like technology uh, and infrastructure development under Belt and Road? Sure. And no, thanks. And I think, um, uh, you know, maybe to get to the, to the, the, uh, the sort of the rub, the nub of the issue. I think, um, you know, Matt makes the argument very eloquently for democracy's uh, uh, advantages, and I largely uh, agree with him. I think the question is a matter of degree and the policy implications where this is differs. And I think, uh, you know, the reason that, that, that he and I differ somewhat on some of these issues, although agreeing on many of them, is sort of the degree of confidence, or I would say sanguinity, um, that we should have about how we'll fare against China. And I think you're bringing uh, a great example of the issue. I mean, my experience in Southeast Asia and, and, you know, following and so forth is that the Chinese have an enormous amount to bring. Uh, they bring it in a very tight package, as you put it. Some of the things that Matt talks about as advantages, which are advantages, like, for instance, that, the you know, the United States has difficulty lying, has difficulty being corrupt through things like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Those can also be disadvantages when you're trying to sway countries that, you know, or leaderships that might have an interest in quick money or money that won't be so well-tracked. I mean, that's not the better side of human nature, but that's, of course, the reality of, of international politics, which, which Matt knows well. So I think the, the I'm more concerned, you know, for instance, Huawei is a gr another great example where countries know, I think, that there are huge strings attached to this, but the money is hard to pass up. And the Chinese have been putting a huge amount of, uh, you know, dumped a huge amount of R&D money and, and money in, in Huawei in general to capture market share, to create this sort of irresistible package. I'm kind of reminded of the old Columbia House CDs where you, you know, sign up for $9.99 and pretty soon you're paying hundreds of dollars a year without, without really knowing it. I mean, I don't want to make light of it, but I think that's kind of the, the problem that, that we face. And so, I, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what Matt is saying about democracy's advantages, but I think they're, they're balanced by disadvantages. And so, you know, I think for people who are, share a real sense of the need to compete in this great power world, as he and I do, this is, I think, you know, he's at the, at the leading edge of, you know, sort of one side of that, how do we compete? That's more, I think, perhaps, I would say sanguine, he would probably say confident in how democracies will, will fare. And, you know, we could happy to get into some of the historical examples, which are very interesting. Maybe that's, that's for another time. But, but I think that's how I look at, say, the South Station. And, of course, they say, uh, you know, you look at people like Mahathir or Duterte, or Jokowi, I mean, these are not, you know, or the Thai government, these are not perfect model Democrats, uh, liberal Democrats, so they have their, and, and once they move down the Chinese path, it's often hard to extricate themselves. 
there's a kind of a path dependency uh, issue that I think the Chinese are, are, are acutely aware of and are trying to take advantage of. So my my view is that is that competition is going to be a lot tougher, and the consequences of that are we are going to need to make more changes to our legacy foreign policy, particularly post 1989, and prioritize much more on on China. Uh, even at the expense of other threats that, that that we perceive in the international environment. So per Bridges examples, uh, Matt, let me let me throw you a, a couple of those. And by the way, the number of attendees has gone up, which is which is really impressive. And I love uh, Bridge that you've dated you and me, frankly, with Columbia Records. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, so, oh, so okay. So Mahathir is one example. Full Malaysian, uh, now former prime minister, former prime minister from. It looks like Nick um, He's listened and they adjusted. That's one example. Two is in Indonesia. Minister Luhut, who we interviewed, said, look, I love U.S. technology. I love U.S. and Japanese investment. But as Bridge was saying, the package is better. Huawei's uh, ahead of the game on 5G. This is a few months ago. Uh, and the, beat, the, the Belt and Road package from China is better than anything the U.S. and the Japanese uh, are offering. So it's, take those two examples. Uh, on with the notion that, again, the Chinese have uh, the genies out of the bottle, and it's hard to put it back in, so to speak. Yeah, good um, question. And, um, you know, to just build on something, the bridge, I, I think that most of us agree that uh, China is the foremost national security challenge uh, facing the country, that the United States and its allies need to uh, do a lot more to get ready uh, for this competition. Um, uh, as Bridge said, I'm just a little bit more confident about our fundamentals, um, maybe compared to China's. And so this is uh, one place where China is undoubtedly um, increasing its influence using Belt and Road. Uh, it's increased its uh, influence uh, a lot in Southeast Asia, but in Africa, and, and even in you know, an area we uh, uh, used to think of as America's backyard in, in Europe. Um, China's gaining influence through BRI, through technology. Um, so this is a challenge. Um, on the other hand, I think one of the things we've seen with autocracies um, over the, the millennia is that they have a hard time um, uh, accumulating power without provoking a backlash. Um, democracies uh, tend to be better at becoming uh, powerful without their neighbors becoming frightened. Um, and I think we've uh, seen that with Xerxes 2,500 years ago, Napoleon, Hitler, and I think we're seeing that now with China. Uh, we're seeing this kind of counterbalancing coalition beginning to form. So after China sees the port in Sri Lanka, uh, you've had other countries in Southeast Asia uh, become more skeptical of Belt and Road Initiative and the debt trap uh, that that might entail. Uh, we've seen um, the United States as uh, one country who started to balance, declaring uh, China as the greatest national security threat. We've seen the European Union declare China as a, quote, system rival. Uh, we see the, this quad um, forming in Asia of India, Japan, uh, the United States and Australia working together more um, against uh, China. You know, so having done this deep research, I, I see this fitting a pattern. Yes, China is starting to make some gains, uh, but uh, we see the rest of the world beginning to balance together uh, against it. So we turn to Morgan uh, now and ask about that. Let me just uh, mark this moment, though. It's 10 o'clock. Uh, we'll go probably for just about another five minutes, 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to your questions and Morgan has to leave a little early. So just um, to prepare for that, uh, there is a, a way for you to raise your hand. Uh, and so uh, that is through the participants panel, uh, the chat panel, you can raise your hand and, and I'm gonna be able to see your hands in a few minutes. Uh, and, and so in about 10 minutes or so, we'll, we'll turn it over to questions. Um, so Morgan, to to uh, math points. Uh, so so two things. One, what are the what are the arguments that the Trump administration is making to some of these countries that have either been interested in, say, they're dependent on Belt and Road uh, investments, uh, and and how is that being received? And then Matt also suggested that the U.S. and the European Union had some uh, alignment on on uh, perception of China. How does the Trump administration? try and exploit that when there are obvious concerns from the president, the administration itself, uh, on kind of historic trade balances with historic allies. So I think that this is a very clarifying moment uh, for Trump administration policy. I mean, if you think of the two things that President Trump ran on that he's most known for since, since 2015 when he announced 
It's securing our borders and bringing U.S. and uh, bringing manufacturing back home to the U.S. And if anything, I think that this crisis has has highlighted uh, what we what we saw in that election, the policies that the Trump administration has pursued over the past few years. You know, there was a lot of criticism early on. We were one of the first, maybe the first uh, country, uh, one of the first countries around the world to close our borders in January uh, to China because of the threat. Um, of the of the pandemic, and we have since had to work very closely. Um, you saw the announcements last week with Canada and Mexico as it relates to only essential travel going through those two borders as well. Um, certainly on the manufacturing front, um, my uh, friend and colleague Peter Navarro could probably speak to all of you about this ad, ad nauseum, uh, but I think if you talk to the average American right now, regardless of political affiliation or party, um, there's certainly a concern um, that, the, that our medical equipment, that, that crucial things related to national security during a pandemic um, is not manufactured here. Once again, I'm, I'm a big believer coming from the private sector um, in the ability for American companies to, to reinvent and, and to meet the needs. And we've seen a number of companies announcing that yesterday in, in the past week at the White House, um, how they're going to pursue uh, uh, more manufacturing here in the U.S. So if anything, I, I, I think the Trump administration would feel that, that our two signature policies have been clarified and have been crystallized in a way that probably none of us, to be honest, even expected uh, it to be before before this pandemic um, set on. As it relates to China and uh, Huawei and the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, I've had the, the massive honor and privilege of traveling with Secretary Pompeo around the world. Um, for the past year, uh, I think I've been on every international trip with him and he's been wonderful um, and really mentoring me and including me in his meetings. And I can tell you that there's I can't think of a meeting um, that we've had around the world where we haven't talked about Huawei, where we haven't talked about the threat of uh, 5G networks that are beholden to authoritarian um, regimes. Uh, obviously, we have had uh, our challenges and, and being able to convey and to communicate uh, those threats um, to the world. Um, but as it, as it relates to, you know, Belt and Road, um, I, I, I think, you know, it just took time for these examples that, um, that Nick mentioned to start playing themselves out. Now we're seeing it in real time. And, you know, if, if this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic doesn't clarify for the world where where everyone stands, what's truly, uh, you know, behind the curtain, I'm, I'm not sure what else uh, could. So um, we will continue, obviously, um, to, to take a firm position as it relates to Huawei and, and any 5G that would be holden to an authoritarian regime. And I think, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I think that this pandemic... Uh, an unintended uh, consequence is, is that this pandemic, uh, I, I think, is shedding a ton of light uh, on our on our policies um, as it relates to Huawei, as it relates to 5G, and then of course at home as it relates to the to President Trump's singular focus on bringing manufacturing back to the United States and securing our borders. Rich Colby, I'll, I'll give you the last word. Um, you obviously were in in the administration and helped draft uh, the language uh, that Matt. Um, referred to earlier uh, about the, the giant kind of U.S. declaration of balancing against China, uh, and now you're out of the administration. So from the outside, uh, as Morgan just suggested, if, if COVID-19 doesn't clarify uh, to countries around the world the nature of China, what would? Is, is that how you see it? Uh, and, and to go back to the notion of, of allies and working together, uh, what is the state of the world uniting uh, against China, or at the very least, the United States and, and European allies united against China? And do you believe that's happening? Well, um, I think Morgan put it put it very well. I think on your first point, I think COVID is is kind of a, a very vivid demonstration. It's not the only one. Um, you know, uh, I mean, we've lived in thirty years, the last thirty years of kind of unipolarity and the sort of kind of era of globalization. I think a lot of the strategic kind of concerns of, of pretty much most of human history before that had sort of attenuated. So people cease to take them very seriously. And the notion that, for instance, states would act, particularly great powers would act in this sort of uh, uh, very assertive or even, even malign way it seemed academic or an abstraction. And I think we've had it driven home in a very uh, uh, visceral way, um, as well as our vulnerability. And I think what Morgan was saying about about bringing manufacturing home as appropriate to make sure that we don't have uh, this intolerable level of vulnerability seems like something that everybody's going to have to get behind. I don't know who would who would oppose that, at least to some degree, at, the, at this point. In terms of the coalition, I think Matt put it well in terms of in the book and so forth. And 
favorable, and I, I always emphasize favorable regional balances of power. I think one of the areas where where I'm a little less confident than he, I, I believe we can do it, but I think it's going to be really hard, is forming and sustaining an anti-hegemonial coalition against China, particularly in Asia. Europe is another area. I mean, I've been talking to the Germans a lot. You guys at the Atlantic Council obviously know Europe better than, better than anybody, but but I think it's touch and go. I mean, the UK decision on Huawei, uh, where the Germans appear to be leave, leaning, at least where, where Chancellor Merkel has, has been, is not encouraging. I think there are str- countries in Asia that are strong, uh, Japan, Vietnam, India, but a lot of the Southeast Asian states, you know, which are going to be a, a, a already significant but growing portion of global uh, GDP, are a little bit iffier. Uh, so, you know, Matt's right to point out the Sri Lanka example, but it also, you know, things go back and forth. I think Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, et cetera, it's still, I mean, even South Korea, uh, Philippines, it's still, uh, it's going to be a, a, a near run thing. Uh, and I think, you know, we really need to focus on on that uh, as our as our number one goal. And I, you know, commend certainly Secretary Pompeo's focus on China, other people in the administration who, who very clearly have called this out and bring up uh, uh, this issue everywhere. I, one of the things that I noticed in, in the past was that, for instance, when senior American officials would go to Asia, they would often talk about issues in the Middle East or Africa or terrorism. And now we're in a position where our senior officials, when they go to Europe or Latin America or Africa, they're talking about China. And that's the right way to be to be thinking about and doing things. And we haven't even discussed countries like Kenya, which uh, signed a deal with uh, their their Belt and Road Initiative um, deal would, would give away part of um, uh, one of the largest ports in East Africa and, and Latin America, of course. Um, all right, so so much to talk about. Uh, it's about 10.05, 10.07 or so. We've got about eight minutes left with uh, with Morgan, uh, and then she has to leave. So I, I will turn it over to the audience. Uh, and uh, I see General Breedlove uh, is here, former um, Supreme Commander in, in Europe. Uh, and I'm wondering if we could open up his mic, and if not, then, then he has written his question. Um, so, but General Breedlove, if, if you're there and can see that, can you, uh, can we open his, his mic and, and fire away? Breedlove's mic should be open. If you could unmute, please. We'll give him a second to try to figure it out. Okay, I think that's working now, maybe. There we go, we can hear you. So fabulous panel. Um, and I uh, already ordered my book, free delivery through Amazon as well. Uh, it's going to be a little slow, but I look forward to reading. So don't take this as criticism, but I, I've been writing a lot of notes, and I feel like we had great discussion, a little light on the what do we do? What does this group of people do? How do we help our nation move forward? And as you saw in my notes, I don't think we can boil the ocean, but I think we can strip away some things that we might actually make some contributions and drive policy or drive what's next. And my vote, uh, I'm a broken record on this, Damon and others have heard me way too many times. I think we need to get after this message thing. Our government is just not there yet. I'm really disappointed in the the sort of the growth and the use of the GEC, and we really haven't brought our government together in a way that can rapidly react to messages and much of the discussion of China and COVID and other things, we need to be better at. So I'll shut up there. I don't want to dominate time. Thanks for allowing me. Morgan, you want to start and take that off? Uh, yeah, um, that's a really interesting observation. I, I'm ju- I don't know if we can get the general back on, but uh, I'm just wondering if there's like a specific example that he could speak to that might help me answer better. Morgan. Yes, can you hear me? I think I'm yes, unmuted sir. again. Yes, sir. So, so we we originally built the GEC to try to speed up governmental response to messaging mm-hmm. and to get us back in the game of being able to respond to, as you said, these autocratic nations mm-hmm. that I talk about the speed and power of a lie. And we don't have right. the speed and power of response. And we are constrained by truth. And so we need that organization that is empowered and held accountable for organizing our government to a more rapid response in these messaging issues. Again, constrained by truth. I'm not talking about creating propaganda, but using truths persistently 
and pervasively so that we can answer some of these things out there. And not trying to do tip for tap for every little thing, but mm-hmm. pick those uh, narratives that we need to attack. And someone needs to be held accountable and be empowered to make this government more responsive than that. And Morgan, That's my just, before, opinion. Sorry, General, and Morgan just before you uh, uh, answer, just making sure that everyone understands the GEC is the Global Engagement Center. Morgan mentioned um, the head of the Global Engagement Center who released a bunch of information the other day. That is the information center uh, that's designed to deal with this stuff that the general was speaking about. Sorry. Yeah, no, and, and the GEC, I think, is incredibly important in this in this fight, messaging um, fight that we're in. You know, the GEC, as the general knows, was originally set up and had a very counterterrorism uh, focus. Um, and it has, I, I know Leah, in the past year that she, year and a half that she's been in charge, um, has undergone an, an enormous effort to, to continue, obviously, to work on that CT mandate, uh, but to focus on the uh, Chinese and Russian uh, narratives, Iranian narratives that we're having to uh, to certainly combat. Um, I, I mean, listen, I, I think if the perception out there um, by people as smart as the generals that we're not being quick enough, that's 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 a point that I'll take. Um, and I think that there's always room for improvement. I'll tell you what what we're doing at State uh, is, is a few different things. Uh, number one, we're trying to, we decided not to let this disinfo sit, right? Especially when we saw it coming from uh, CCP officials. So uh, as I mentioned over the past few weeks, uh, we started in engaging directly with their counterparts, uh, both through the secretary at the podium and in interviews, uh, myself and in interviews and, and uh, on social media as well. Um, and that was, a, that was a marked difference for us. We have in the past, uh, we've often sort of let, uh, we, we've let the GEC, I'm talking about from, you know, the secretary and myself, from the, the officials, uh, the public faces of the State Department, we've let the GEC and other organization take on that disinfo in, uh, in cyberspace. Um, and then of course, this the secretary and I made a much more concerted effort to tackle this disinfo head on. Uh, you saw the president did that as well. Uh, listen, it remains to be seen if President Xi will keep his promise to President Trump from their from their phone call last week that the president talked about. But but I think clearly, at least for the short term, um, as we as we see Chinese Communist Party officials uh, stopping this, um, uh, repeating their ambassadors, retweeting all of these conspiracy theories, even in the short term, that's a win. Um, but in this environment, um, a win can only last so long, and it's something that we are going to remain incredibly vigilant for. So on one hand, we're incredibly focused on calling out the disinfo as much as as much as we see it. Uh, my Twitter page is probably very interesting for any of you that want to look. Uh, Zarif and I get in daily hand-to-hand combat related to their disinfo. But we do fundamentally believe, as I talked about in one of the earlier questions, um, that we have to tell the, the true and the real story of what uh, the United States, what the American taxpayer is doing. So you're going to continue to see a real focus um, from us on on telling our story of what we're doing in these international organizations, the 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 the, the aid that we give that is you know that is no strings attached, right? That is because we are trying to do the right thing to solve the pandemic. And when we come out of this, um, we do need to we need to push for uh, through this whole process for more transparency from governments around the world, for more accountability, um, because that's the only way we're ever going to truly fight one of these other pandemics together. So I think we could always do more. I take that point on, but our approach, at least at the moment, is to tackle the disinfo head on while simultaneously doing everything we can to tell the positive stories of what the United States is doing, because it's real, it's powerful. And when you look at the numbers in black and white, it's a stark difference from uh, our other geopolitical competitors. So it's about 10.15. I will thank Morgan Ortegas, who has to run. Uh, Sorry. Got to go to the podium. Incredibly busy, and, and you've got a podium visit to go to. So thank you so much, and, and we'll see thanks. the secretary in a few minutes. And, and thanks uh, on behalf of everyone, and, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Uh, moving on uh, to another hand raised, uh, John Dover. Uh, let me open up. John Dover's hand, yes, hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. My name is John Sullivan. I'm up here in Dover. Uh, for many I worked with the Dover, New Hampshire. Uh, many years I worked with the Center for International Private Enterprise, part of the National Endowment for Democracy. So I really appreciate everything that you're doing. And the uh, I, I think I'm going to have to get a copy of this book. It sounds really good. But my question is, 
For many years during the great private power rivalry with the Soviet Union, we were driven by the brilliant strategy of George Kennan, the containment strategy, which was not only strategic, but it also had tactical direction. Do we have something similar now? Do we have a coherent, logical, strategic picture that is a long-term picture, which also works down to the tactical level? I haven't heard one articulated, but maybe since I'm in Dover, I don't get all the news. So over to you. Do you want to start with that? Well, I think um, I think the answer is no. We don't have as as a as a government. We don't have a clear uh, worked out version. I would say, you know, Kennan's uh, not to be uh, quibble, but Kennan had this sort of uh, containment idea, but he had much different ideas than what we actually ended up implementing over the course of the Cold War in terms of how it was actually carried out. Um, <coughs> I'll, 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 I'll probably, uh, I should be slapped on the hand, but I'm, I'm working to finish a book that's particularly looking at the kind of defense and military uh, side of what this, would, this might mean. I think in the national defense strategy, we laid out the, the rudiments of, of an approach, which is to say, uh, really what we, gotta, what we need to be focused on is favorable regional balances of power. Uh, the basic idea is that we need a coalition of states that are strong enough to check uh, Chinese hegemony in uh, the Indo-Pacific, and that's what the Defense Department position is through the Indo-Pacific Strategy Report of June of last year. And in order to do that, we need to deny China's uh, most effective uh, theory of victory, uh, to use a term that I think Secretary Mattis liked quite a lot. And in, the, in, in my view, and I think at least from a few things the department has said, the fait accompli is the most dangerous, particularly against exposed allies, and I think Matt makes this point in his book, like Taiwan, uh, is, is, needs to be the pacing challenge. That will give the military protection for states to be able to make autonomous choices based on the political and economic lay of the land. But if they are subject to a Chinese uh, a kind of focused theory of victory, then they're not going to be able to, to act autonomously. For instance, Taiwan clearly does not want to be part of China's sphere of influence, but the Chinese have, have built a military designed to coerce them to do so. So the first, you know, one of the first things we need to get right is this defense strategy, but that of course needs to nest in with a political and economic strategy. There have been moves, things like the Build Act to bring more resources to bear. Uh, Matt mentioned the Quad, although that's, I, I think it's still pretty inchoate given that it's been going on for a long time. So I think from a kind of societal and, and governmental perspective, there's a lot of discussion um, and Matt's book is, is definitely an important contribution in this, but I don't think we're, we're, we're fully there yet. And, and time is short. Matt, are we fully there yet? Well, um, we're, we're not fully there yet, but um, you, know, you know, this discussion um, uh, reminds me of some of the things I wanted to write this book, because I think often in Washington, we focus on um, our weaknesses and, and the adversary's strengths, um, BRI, um, the um, uh, disinformation campaigns, uh, and these are problems, but I think if you want a, an effective competitive strategy, we also need to think about our strengths uh, and their weaknesses. And those are some of the things I try to illustrate in the book. So one of the uh, recommendations is that we do more uh, to sharpen our own uh, competitive edge, uh, strengthen our democracy, which I think is the root um, of, of all of our power, but that facilitates innovation in our economy. It facilitates the United States being the center of the global financial system. Uh, it allows us to build these effective alliances. Uh, it allows us to compete in high-end um, strategic military competitions. Uh, and so one of my recommendations is that we, we strengthen our own uh, sources of advantage. Um, and then uh, one of the other sources of advantage, and I think this is very uh, counterintuitive, uh, is that I think the United States has actually been good at uh, building a long-term uh, sustainable strategy. Uh, so we often hear that uh, China is good at setting a long-term direction, look at BRI, look at Made in China 2025. Uh, meanwhile, we dither in endless debate. Uh, but I actually think the United States has basically had a consistent, coherent grand strategy that's worked really well uh, since 1945, which is uh, kind of building uh, and defending this rules-based uh, international system. Uh, and so the world has changed since 1945, it's changed since 1991. Uh, but I think what we need now is not to uh, throw that model out, but rather to revitalize uh, and adapt it for uh, a new era. Um, so strengthening the alliances, the institutions, uh, the um, you know, economic um, uh, exchange, the, the democracy that has um, played the United States advantage for 75 years and counting. So let's look at uh, another uh, part of the world. Um, 
uh, to see if that grant strategy is, is still working. Uh, I see Alejandro Salesi. I just uh, allowed you to talk um, and we see your hand raised. Can you unmute your mic and, and ask your question? Alejandro, are you still with us? Can you uh, unmute your mic? All right. Well, until he uh, until that mic gets unmuted, I'll just I'll just read his question because he did write it to us. South America's countries, uh, young democracies, tend to be seen as semi autocracies because of their strong presidentialism and low institutionalized administrations. What is your opinion regarding China-U.S. approach to South America? Do you see any advantage for one of them regarding the political context aforementioned? Matt or Bridge, you want to take on South America? Well, I think that given that Bridge is joining us from uh, South America, we should probably go first. <laughs> uh, all right. Although I, I, I have no expertise on, on the subject, uh, so I, I don't claim anything. I think um, maybe what I would say on this is I think this is, a, from my, what I can tell, Latin America is also going to be uh, an area where the Chinese are going to have a, an attractive proposition. I think uh, uh, the, the question focused on the political side, but also the economic side. Obviously, the Latin American economies, most of them are struggling. Uh, there have been disappointments uh, in the emerging market space in Latin America. A lot of them are commodity oriented, which the Chinese are a main consumer of. So I think um, I think it's going to be it's going to be a, a, a tough back and forth. I mean, I think it's been very encouraging to see the uh, deeper alignment between the United States and Brazil uh, under this administration. Um, you know, the Brazil is going to be important, obviously, Mexico, uh, some of these leading, uh, leading, leading states. But um, I, I think I think here, too, it's going to be a, 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 a sort of an ongoing competition where we're really going to have to to um, uh, actively work to to compete. I'm going to read uh, Scott Erickson's question. I don't know if um, he has his mic open, but I think uh, it's it's one that all of us are, are thinking about. Uh, it goes to a few points uh, that were raised before. So Scott Erickson asks, how did we find ourselves in a position where China has a potential chokehold on our strategic supply chains to include our medical supplies and medicines, and how do we correct it? Well, I can Could I, oh, go ahead, Matt, you first. Um, yeah. Yes, so I think, um, you know, this, uh, the roots of this are in our um, post-Cold um, uh, War and then post-Cold War strategy. Uh, after the end of the uh, Cold War, I think many people did think it was the end of history, uh, that uh, democracy and uh, free markets were the future of the international system, uh, that we could cooperate with Russia and China, that they would eventually become responsible stakeholders. Uh, in this rules-based uh, international uh, system. And if you go back even 10 years ago and look at the Obama national security strategy, uh, Russia and China are mentioned a number of times, but never once as possible rivals or threats, uh, only mentioned in terms of opportunities for cooperation. Um, so we've come a long way in the past um, 10 years. Uh, you know, the, the title of the book, The Return of Great Power Rivalry, uh, you know, happened sometime in the past 10 years. Maybe you date it at uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Maybe it's China taking contested territory in the South China Sea. Maybe it's the election of President Xi. Uh, but we are in a much more um, contested uh, environment right now. And so I think U.S. Um, strategy is, is adjusting for that reason. Uh, and so I think that actually the long-term goal of trying to make Russia and China responsible stakeholders uh, in a rules-based system, it's not bad for a, a long-term goal. I think it's just unrealistic uh, in the short to medium term given Russian and Chinese uh, leadership. And so I think what we need to do is to uh, defend uh, the system, um, uh, you know, strengthen ourselves, but also to push back uh, on Russia and China where they are uh, threatening economically, diplomatic, militarily. And I think with the long-term goal of uh, convincing uh, not this generation of leadership, but a future generation of leadership that challenging the United States and its allies uh, is really uh, futile, and uh, they're uh, much better off trying to play along with the system uh, rather than challenge it. So we've yeah, got about can, oh, sorry, Bridge. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, could I jump? Because I think this is another another point of interest. Is and I think Matt actually kind of said what I was going to say, but I'm going to put a slightly different spin on it, which is I I think it's not the post-war post 1945 order 
that is eroding. It's the post-Cold War order, and particularly this kind of proposition of, you know, to use it probably an academic term, which Matt would know better, liberal hegemony. Basically, the idea that we would be and our allies would be the dom predominant power and there wouldn't be serious changes and, and international politics would turn into kind of management of the order. I think one of the things where I have a somewhat different different view than, than Matt, I think, is that, yes, within our system and particularly in the Cold War, there were obviously rules-based issues and there was an order, but really it was a coalition defense against an aspiring hegemon, particularly in the European theater, but elsewhere uh, as well. And so I think this is particularly important because it's what are we really going to focus on over the long term? Are we going to focus on because uh, a lot of the rhetoric I hear over the last few years is kind of we need to protect the order. And I think it actually gets us in the wrong direction. It ends up focusing us on on things that I think are fundamentally secondary or peripheral, whereas really what we're trying to do is prevent China from establishing its hegemony first over the Indo-Pacific and then the broader world. And then from that basis, we'll be in a good a good position to build and sustain the kind of order we want. A great example is what's the problem in the South China Sea? To me, the problem in the South China Sea is fundamentally about the Chinese taking over these islets and then militarizing it and establishing effective control, as Admiral Davidson and Admiral Harris have put it. Other people who are focused more on the order might say, we can actually, we don't have a problem with that if they did it legally in accordance, say, with ICJ ruling. We would still have a problem with it, even if it were done in accordance with ICJ rulings. I'm not saying this is Matt's view, but I think this is a kind of a, I'm inclined to shift away from this discussion of rules-based or liberal national order because I think it's actually uh, distracting us from what the real the kind of core of the problem is, and we don't have we don't have that much bandwidth to give. Hmm. Um, so I've opened it up to Alan Mendoza, and then I'm going to read a question from General Hynout, uh to, uh, to 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 take us off because both uh, go to. The uh, the future and, and what comes next. So, Alan, uh, I've, we've uh, opened your mic. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Thank you, analysts, and great to be you for once from London. Um, there are thoughts that IR practitioners have been putting forward post crisis. Some are saying that autocracies will be strengthened because of the fact that China is going to um, emerge. Uh, strongest out of this. Others say democracies, because of the greater resilience within our populations, will do so. Which view do the panelists accord to? Uh, and then let me just read General Hynote, uh, who is the Deputy Director, Air Force Warfighting Integration Capability uh, at the U.S. Air Force, uh, goes to uh, that idea about what comes next uh, and who's going to win this battle if there is a winner. In light of the COVID-19 crisis, what is likely to change with respect to the U.S. rivalry with China and what is likely to stay the same. Uh, so, Bridge, why don't you start, and, and then, Matt, you can finish this off on both those questions. Okay, I think on, sure, on the first one, I am uh, I think it's going to, we'll see. I mean, I think democracies do have built-in advantages, systemic uh, feedback loops and so forth, but I, I don't think it's a given. I, I wouldn't say that's the, the variable. That, you know, I think it's going to be state action. There'll probably be uh, uh, bring performances uh, across the the democratic uh, and uh, world. So I don't I don't think the I think this democracy and autocracy issue is going to con continue. <coughs> to Q's question, good good to hear from you. I think um, probably the biggest thing that we can see at this point is a fundamental uh, a kind of a caesura on the economic issue. I mean, clearly since the beginning of the administration uh, and and the initiation of the tariffs, there has been a pretty sharp movement in the direction towards some degree of decoupling, uh, which has had bipartisan support, Senator Schumer, Speaker Pelosi, and others. I saw that when I was in Europe a couple months ago, for instance. Um, I think now it's just a given, right? I mean, there. I think the, the shift towards a much different economic relationship is going to be much more irresistible and significant. And you know, it's interesting, uh, Joe Nye, uh, you know, I don't want to criticize him, I don't know if he's on, but I don't, but I think he, he wrote a piece a couple months ago saying uh, interconnectedness is a, um, a, a benefit, it, it, it's a pacifying element. And I, I disagree with that. I'm not sure it's one way or the other, but for instance, it's possible that we could attenuate some of our tensions with the Chinese by not being so dependent on them because we don't get in this situation where they don't deliver ventilators or masks or what have you. I mean, I think there's going to be this enduring geopolitical relationship, but it's possible, you know, some degree of decoupling could actually be a step towards detente, partially because um, the aspirations of the unfettered globalization crowd 
I think we're so unrealistic and so not in accord with, with enduring aspects of international politics. But I think from the defense point of view, uh, you know, planning for, the, for, for contingencies and so forth, I think the reality is there's going to be a much more of a shift away from that and towards, uh, you know, towards alignment within, I think, the community of, you know, largely democracies, although not exclusively, uh, countries that are concerned about uh, Chinese hegemony. I mean, Vietnam would be one that is uh, obviously not a democracy, unfortunately. Uh, India, many people criticize for being liberal, fairly or not. Um, not. I'm not in a position to say, but I think those are the kinds of countries and markets where we're going to have to see more uh, movement. And that could get back to the Latin America issue if we can try to obviously insource uh, things, but where that's not cost efficient or, or make a lot of sense than, than to other uh, other markets to reduce our dependency uh, in, in in core areas uh, away from China. And so, Matt, why don't you finish this off? Because it is uh, ten thirty. You know, first question: Will uh, autocracies be strengthened, or can democracies uh, be strengthened? Uh, and what will change, and what will not change, with between the U.S. and China after this crisis? Well, I do think that COVID nineteen could have uh, big implications for the U.S. China rivalry. Uh, you know, in the book, I uh, talk about a couple. Pandemics. It wasn't the focus, but uh, they were just so relevant to the uh, competitions I looked at, you couldn't help but uh, discuss them. So uh, in the Peloponnesian Wars, uh, Athens was hit by a typhoid outbreak that led to uh, uh, losing something like a quarter of its population, debilitated its military. Uh, they lost their most important leader, Pericles. Uh, it's one of the things that contributed to the loss uh, against the Spartans. Uh, and then also the Venetian Republic got hit uh, by the uh, outbreak of the bubonic plague that came over Silk Road trading routes from China, led to the decline of the Venetian Republic and the shift in balance of power to Northern Europe. Uh, so I think, um, you know, this probably won't be as uh, cataclysmic, but I think it could affect uh, power positions of the United States and China. You know, which one is hit hard uh, economically, uh, which one recovers faster, um, which system, the democracy or the autocracy, is seen as more effective in responding to this crisis could have influence for soft power, building future alliances. Uh, and then there are also, we're already seeing impacts on military readiness uh, with the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, military stopping transfers of personnel, uh, halting exercises, reports of outbreaks uh, on, uh, among certain forces in the U.S., Russia, and, and elsewhere. Uh, so I, I do think it will have uh, implications. Uh, but the uh, early response was, uh, or I think the early perception was the autocracy uh, is doing better. Um, yes, they um, lied in a way that led this pandemic to spread, but then they put in place draconian measures and got this under control. Uh, meanwhile, we're dithering um, in the United States. We have a fragmented response. Um, and I suspect, given the research in the book, that that won't be our long-term conclusion. And I think we're already seeing weaknesses in uh, China's response and some strengths uh, to the U.S. response. Um, China, um, uh, you know, I, I don't trust China's numbers. I don't believe that there are zero new outbreaks, and they were lying about this just a couple of weeks ago. I don't know why we believe their numbers now. Uh, their, you know, so-called aid to Europe turned out to be Chinese companies selling faulty medical equipment uh, that now looks more like profiteering off of uh, Europe's woes. Um, and um, yeah, the U.S. response was slow and, and messy, but that's how democracies work. Uh, but now we have a consensus. Uh, we've just spent uh, two trillion dollars to get us out of this uh, crisis, which is a sign of the fact that we are a financial superpower uh, that can afford a two trillion dollar uh, uh, bailout. Um, and so, um, uh, again, I, I suspect when we look back on this, we'll uh, say that um, uh, you know the the democratic model was was slow and and messy, but uh, in the long run, proved to be superior. Matt, thank you. Bridge Colby, thank you. We will turn it over for the final words uh, to Barry Pavel, uh, as we all know, the director of the Scowcroft Center uh, at the Atlanta Council and, and senior vice president. Barry, over to you. Thanks very much. And uh, boy, what a great uh, conversation about a critically important topic as we're dealing with the tactical and the very important uh, goal of, most important goal of saving lives. Really important to keep our eye on the on the big picture and the, and the big ball too. And so, uh, what a great panel. Thanks to Morgan Ortegas, Nick Schifrin, Bridge Colby, Matt Kranig for joining us. Uh, certainly the great power rivalry questions remain urgent, especially as the global order is experiencing what may be the most important shock since the Second World War. We don't know yet. Uh, to me, it really remains to be seen how and, and critically importantly and not discussed enough when 
the major players, the US, China, Russia, the EU will emerge from the current crisis. The pandemic is testing the resilience of the US and other de democratic countries as, as Dr. Koenig's book discusses. And, and as he just mentioned, pandemics have hastened the fall of past democratic powers. But on an optimistic note, as, as Matt ended, um, the book also demonstrates that democracies have great advantages which could help the US and our allies emerge stronger from this uh, crisis. So thank you once again, all of you, for joining us virtually today. Please stay engaged. Please send us emails. Uh, please watch out for future Atlantic Council and Scowcroft Center events on these critically important uh, sets of topics. Thank you very much.